So the golden calf, it's a story I assume that everyone knows. And I assume everyone knows it because it's one of those sort of foundational stories that you learn in Sunday school. Uh, you know, when you get those little kids Bibles, which are all pictures, it's definitely one of those stories that comes up. And I thought to begin with today, I'm just going to go through what I would do if I was uh, talking about this story in a Sunday school setting. But because obviously we are much smarter than the dumb little kids, we're going to get through it a lot quicker, right? OK, I don't believe that. Um, the amount of times I've been up in space and I've been very confidently talking about something for someone to go, well, Callum, surely this is the thing. And I'm like, oh, no, I've completely um, I've done something wrong here. And then, you know, I'm spending the next 10 minutes trying to say, yes, you're right, without saying that I was wrong. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's used to that. I do it quite a lot. Um, but the story of the golden calf, as I think we all get taught at some point in a sort of Sunday school style, is that Moses has gone up to the mountain to talk to God. And he's been up there a while and uh, the people start getting worried down. Israel gets worried because Moses has been gone. Um, I like this uh, idea that when people celebrate Passover, they use this word day new, which was it? Um, that would be enough. When the people that the Passover was about clearly did not understand that concept, because literally every time something went slightly wrong, they're like, well, nothing is enough. Everything is wrong. Woe be me. And so Israel is down at the bottom of Mount Sinai and they got really worried and they go and they force Aaron to make a new uh, God for them. And, you know, poor, sweet Aaron, the first high priest of Israel, there he is just trying to do his work. And the Israelites have come. They've told him, you're going to build this new uh, statue for us. And Aaron, Aaron relents, despite the fact that it's going to break the, the first two commandments, as the video said. And they do that. And then at this point, um, in the sort of Sunday school setting, you talk about what is an idol? And you have a long conversation about, you know, maybe it's um, what what do you sort of worship? You say, oh, is it celebrities? Is it sports? And then you bring out the heavy hitter of, oh, maybe it's your phone. And all the young people look at you and go, wow, this is this is really wise stuff coming here. And you end the conversation somewhere along the, in the ballpark of, oh, an idol is anything which threatens to sort of replace God in your worship. And that's a good message to uh, sort of finish on. You feel happy about that and you carry on with the story. And um, Moses comes down from the mountain and he sees everyone doing all this terrible stuff and he smashes the uh, tablets and he goes back up to God. And God goes, I'm going to kill them all. And Moses goes, no, please don't do it. And God's like, OK, I won't kill them all. And then you sort of finish off your session with the young people and you explain to them that God's grace is bigger than any sin that you can commit. And that is, it's a lovely message. And that's the story which we all know. And it's not really how the Bible does the story. Uh, so the mistakes in what I've just said there, first of all, Aaron is not forced to make the uh, golden statue. Like, uh, well, maybe that's just something I always thought thinking, you know, because Aaron is such a great guy in the rest of the Bible. But in where we start off in uh, 32 verse one, uh, when the people saw that Moses was so long coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. And for this fellow, as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. It almost seems like Aaron's idea when you actually read it, right? They've, the people have come up to him and said, we've got this problem, we want a new God. And, but they haven't, it doesn't say they demanded it. They, they just told him what they want. And Aaron's like, yeah, sure. Why not? It's a slightly different <laughs> idea on Aaron than what I thought before, where Aaron just flat out goes yeah and you know what I know exactly what we're going to do about this and Aaron is like the most complicit person the high priest of Israel just straight in there first mention of any trouble yeah I'll just do whatever you guys say that seems like the wise thing to do here um and in doing that and as that video is mentioned this is in the middle of the building of the tabernacle and you know talking last week about they spent all this time this story in itself 
almost fits in as like the opposite of the tabernacle story in the fact that this is where the tabernacle is something that God has designed and he's decided it's going to be made. This is being designed and decided that it's going to be made by the people um, instead of a place where people are going to leave offerings to their uh, to God. It was going to be a place where they're going to demand stuff from their, their new deity. Um, instead of something being painstakingly built over the course of a long time, so there's very specific instructions, this is basically hastily put up overnight. And instead of like a small intimate area which is closed off, this was going to be something in front of everyone, open for all. And more importantly, was also just going to be a statue and therefore completely pointless and wasn't going to be able to do anything. This is the exact opposite of the tabernacle in the middle of the tabernacle story. Aaron, who's sort of got a bit of a leadership role in all this, has just instantly gone, yeah, let's just do the opposite. This, Mo Moses has been gone for, I don't know, a day, two days. He's pretty old. He's probably got lost up there. Let's just, let's just do something else. Um, and the other thing which I think is... Um, I didn't really notice the a thousand times that I've been read, I've known this story. The car, golden calf is not a replacement of God. Um, it's actually a replacement of Moses. They're like, oh, Moses has gone missing. Let's just replace him with a statue. In the fact that when, um, so Aaron's just built this and all the people see it and they say, um, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And we go down, Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. It wasn't, we built uh, this new statue and now we're all going to worship that statue. They built this statue and they're still going to carry on worshipping uh, God, right? Which I never <laughs> really considered before. This wasn't a instead of God statue. This was a, oh, also, this is, Oh, well, we had God and we had Moses who sort of did what God told him to do and like led us. And obviously now Moses got missing. We're going to need a replacement for that. And that's what this um, calf was going to be. But obviously God will still be still be there with us. Uh, this is in addition to which then brings into, uh, I suppose you can fit that into your little Sunday school teaching because you bring that like, ah, oh, an idol isn't just something which replaces God, but it's something which is like you know just wrong theology or it's like um it takes away some of your worship potential let's say because it's uh you, you still believe in god but you can still have idols okay fair enough also the big thing which um it annoys me every time i see this is moses didn't find out about the calf by coming down the mountain and then getting angry and smashing the stones god told moses beforehand in fact, the story about the bit where God says, I'm going to kill everyone, and then Moses tells him not to, happens before Moses comes down the mountain. He, um, Moses is like, no, don't kill everyone. And God's like, OK. And then Moses comes down and goes, ah, oh, and then he gets angry. And this is where the story, it feels weird that the story ends here for us, because what does Moses come down and do? Everyone's safe from God, apparently. Well, Moses, first of all, he comes down the mountain. And when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hand and breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. OK, that's from the story we all know. Um, then he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground the powder and scattered it in water and made the Israelites drink it. OK, and again, you know, Moses is angry and he's punishing people and he's getting rid of the problem but later on in well later not even that later on in this bit he goes uh he's talking to the levites and he says this is what the lord god of israel says each man strap a sword to his side go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other each killing his brother and friend and neighbor the levites did as moses commanded and that day about three thousand of the people died now I remember like the first time I was properly reading through Exodus and, you know, you get to this bit where Moses is like, God, don't, don't kill all the people. And God's like, yeah, okay. And you think, ah, oh, this is such a lovely story. And then it's like, wait a minute. And then Moses kills the people. 
that doesn't fit into the Sunday school story I read. I've never seen a picture book where uh, God's like, I won't kill everyone, and then everyone still ends up dead. Even worse than that, it's not just Moses killing them. Uh, like in the same chapter, at the end of it, and the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. Even God's still killing people. And it's like, where has this uh, message of, uh, well, it just seems really odd that we finished the story just slightly before all of this has happened, just so we can fit in this, well, God's grace is bigger than uh, your sin message. Okay. I want to iterate here. I am not saying that I don't believe in the I message. God is greater than your sin before I get like kicked out for heresy or whatever. But in context of this story, it feels like we've been telling it slightly wrong, that we're finishing just before all of this happens. Um, it's a bit like, uh, I don't know, if we had Romeo and Juliet and we finished the story at them falling in love. I mean, like, man, it truly is the greatest love story, right? And then later on, someone who's read the rest of the book says, well, not really, they all die. And you're like, what? This clearly isn't a love story. Us finishing it, oh, God's not going to kill everyone, is not the whole story. Luckily, all these people being killed also isn't the whole story. The story does continue. Um, there's, there's the old joke, isn't there? If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And this always, this comes up quite a lot. And I'm not sure, quite a lot of discussions, I mean, always seem to end up like when you're praying and stuff around the idea of you should never go to God with your plans, but you should go to God and ask him what his plans are so you can join in with them. And that seems, that's a good message, right? We're not, I'm, again, iterating, I'm not disputing the idea of wanting to join in with God's plans. Um, but this story is uh, Moses not really following that advice. Um, and the fact that he does sort of go, God tells Moses his plans and Moses is like, no, 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 no. I'm not sure how many of you are drunken brawlers. Um, anyone here? Put your hands up if you get into fights outside pubs a lot. Oh, oh Dan, Dan, yeah, always. <laughs> Do you, you guys know the, um, the hold me back tactic? Um, it's quite a common thing that you'll see quite often if you go down the Guildhall, um, Guildhall Square late at night at three in the morning when, well, I'm sometimes there, not often, I just want to point out, and I'm not doing this tactic, um, but it's basically where you are about to start a fight with someone, but instead of like just going out and punching them, you get your friend to hold you back somehow, or like putting their hand over your chest or something, while you sort of throw your arms around in massive shapes and scream at the top of your voice something a lot of words of don't hold me back or uh, let me at him let me at him the idea being that the other person is then going to be really scared because they see that despite the fact that you haven't actually attacked them yet you clearly have the intent and you've clearly got the power to fight them right um it's a tactic which never works um it always ends up in an actual fight <laughs> I suppose what it does is it means you don't have to throw the first punch. But there's almost, <laughs> I don't want to say that God's a drunken brawler, but there's almost this approach in um, the first time that God's talking to Moses about destroying people. He says, um, let me find my verse in here. Um, I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Now, it sort of almost seems like God's asking Moses' permission here in the fact that he's saying, I will do this, but first you've got to do that. Um, God has, almost God hasn't really decided that he's going to destroy the people. He's just sort of saying, he's inviting Moses into a dialogue about it. He's saying, let me go, uh, you go this and let me at them, basically. Let me at them. And in the way that uh, I have often had to explain to my mates while I'm holding them back as they're trying to start a fight, you sort of explain to your friend why it's not a good idea. Normally, along the lines of there's a police officer over there, um, 
that guy's bigger than you and I'm not going to actually help you in this fight. Uh, Moses has a slightly different tactic, obviously. Um, he basically, he sort of goes through and explains to, uh, uh, not explains, but he says to God, you know, basically, you know, you've only just saved these people and you said that they were going to be assigned to um, all, all the other nations and what the other nations going to think if the people that you've just brought out of Egypt all died mysteriously in the desert. Um, and, you know, basically, you know, you promised these people, you promised that they would go to the promised land. Um, what Moses does is he is talking to God about what he knows about God already. It's not, oh, please don't do this because um, it wouldn't be nice. It's more, God, you, would, you shouldn't do this because it's not who you are. Moses knows this about God. Now, and what it really, what I think it shows here is that God really takes that relationship with Moses seriously in the fact that he has allowed this dialogue to happen. And when Moses said that, we don't even know what God says um, because all it says is the Lord relented, right? And then Moses goes down, gets angry, kills a bunch of people, you know, past a old Bibles, <laughs> Old Testament stuff. Uh, and the second, Moses goes back up to the mountain and this is just before God sends the plague, and he's slightly less successful this time. Because um, Moses comes up and he says, uh, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. And then he sort of throws his own neck on the line and says, but if not, block me out of the book you have written. And God then explains, like, well, I'm going to have to punish the people who've done this sin and that's sort of why the um that's why the plague comes about okay um so he's not lucky but that's not where this story ends it doesn't end with god saying well i'm going to punish these people it goes on um and moses uh first of all god sort of declares to moses that he's not going to be with israel anymore so the conversation goes on there then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Um, so not quite as bad as God is going to kill everyone, but still not great for the Israelites, right? God has declared that he is no longer going to be there. He just can't, he can't do it. And it's, it's for their own safety. And the thing I notice here is that he's, God sort of washed his hands of the Israelites in the fact that he says to Moses, the people you brought out, almost like this is your responsibility, Moses. I've washed my hands of these people. They're clearly not going to do what I'm telling them. Um, but, and obviously this isn't a great place for Israel to end up. Again, not the end of the story, because what Moses does is he actually forces a continuation of that conversation. And I've got to say, I really like how direct Moses is in it. Um, Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favour with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favour with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Um, what I like about it is just how direct Moses is. right? Every, pretty much everywhere in the Bible, whenever anyone's talking to God, it's all like, great reverence and like please please don't hurt me almost Moses is just full out ready for an argument right he's um he comes out swinging and he's like lord you have promised this you've promised this again it's lord we know I know this about you you've got to you're going to do what you're going to say right and it kind of pays off um the lord replied 
my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And it's clearly not good enough for Moses. And there's sort of, there's a bit of back and forth. And it finishes, when they say it finishes, there's possibly my, my favourite verse in this section and possibly the whole Old Testament, actually, is um, verse 18 of uh, chapter 33. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. He's going through this argument with God and each time he's sort of going a bit further in with his argument. And in the end, he's just sort of lost all, I don't know, holding himself back. And he's like, just give me the top thing. God, I want to see your glory. Um, and he, he sort of demands it, which, I mean, like, I feel like me and God are good friends, right? I've, I've known him a few years now. We, we go back a bit. But I definitely would not um, have the guts to do that. Moses is definitely someone who's pretty brave and knows God pretty well to be able to demand something like that. Now, God, he kind of agrees, he kind of doesn't. He says, okay, you, we'll go to this like um, a bit of a mountain, right? I, I don't know, you can sort of hide in the crag of a rock and I'll walk past you and I'm going to put my hand over you so you can't see me. But then when I've passed, I'll lift it, you'll see my back because you won't survive if you see my face. Fair enough. But there's actually something else he says in that, which is... Um, so I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you and I will, will proclaim my name. It's um, he's not just going, he's OK, I'll show you. But he's sort of saying to Moses, the important thing here, right, is not what I look like. I remember when I was um, probably like five or something, I was in the Sunday school that haven't met this church and we were all asked to draw a picture of God and we all had to. And it was all a bunch of kids all drawing rather random stuff. I, I drew a very old man with a very old beard sat in a hammock, right? And it was quite a good sort of lesson because afterwards it was explained, but, oh, no one really knows what God looks like. And, um, you know, was, some people drew like very abstract things. Someone just drew Jesus, which I feel like sort of a cheating answer, but, you know, a correct one nonetheless. Um, but here we know that, God knows it doesn't really matter what he looks like in the fact that none of us have our faith based in sort of any sort of optical vision on what God looks like, right? Um, none of us sort of, well, I don't know, maybe you close your eyes and you can see God, but it doesn't really matter to us what, our faith isn't based in that. If God turned up one day and he was, I don't know, a horse or something, that's not going to be too shaking to our well actually okay we know that we're made in the image of god but you know we a jelly baby's made in the image of a human so we have no idea really what god looks like and it doesn't matter what matters is knowing who god is and he says this right he says i will proclaim my name um in your presence um he's telling moses if you're going to if you're going to see me the important thing is, is you're also going to have to hear me. You're going to know who I am. And he does that when he um, when he does go through with it. And they, you know, it's the Old Testament. They didn't have uh, proper editors when they were writing their stories back then. And they spend a lot of time explaining what's going to happen. And then they tell you what's happening because that shows that it's important. But when God does go forward, he says it again. Um, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming um, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious Lord, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, rebel um, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wick wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents of the third and fourth generation. Now, this is something which gets said quite a lot throughout the Bible, uh, sort of in various ways and forms but it's important to God that not only do we like if you're going to see him that's not so much it's about knowing him God goes past and he tells Moses exactly who he is and it has an effect on Moses because instantly afterwards Moses seeks forgiveness right um Lord uh, Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped Lord he said if you have found favor in your if 
If I have found favour in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive your wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Now, the thing that is changed here from the first time when Moses asked for forgiveness and God's like, yeah, but you, I'm not coming with you from now on, is the first time back in chapter 32, um, Moses says, a great sin these people have committed, they have made themselves gods of gold. Now Moses is taking responsibility for that sin as well. It's not just, oh God, look at how everyone's mucked up. Somehow in this sort of time with God, Moses has changed tracks and gone, well, clearly I am also responsible. Um, and he asked God like to come with us, but this time it's not just before where he said, come with us because you said you're going to, but he says, you know, come with us because we are stiff necks. So like that word comes up quite a lot in this, doesn't it? Stiff necked. Um, you know, come with us, but come be not in spite of us failing, but because we are continuously failing. We need you, God, to be with us. And at this point, the Lord said, I'm making a covenant with you. And he sort of re he makes a new covenant with Moses and you know with Israel. Um, for all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Now, the big difference to this, to the covenants of the past, is that this is no longer God saying, do, if you do this, then I will be your God. God saying, yeah, you guys are going to muck up. I'm going to do the stuff regardless now. I will perform these wonders no matter what. And it's not like it, this is now like a free for all because he then continues to give rules. Uh, he says at one point, um, the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God, which feels somewhat um, repetitive. It'd be a bit like saying the dwarf who is called grumpy is a bit of a grump, right? The Lord who is called jealous is a jealous God. God's still reminding like, you know, there are rules and you are going to be expected to follow them. But from now on, the following isn't why I'm going to be helping you. And then the conclusion to this story, after all this back and forth between God and Moses, is that when Moses comes and it's a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a change in pace in some ways, because when Moses from uh, chapter 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites um, saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. Now, this is clearly a big turning point in the story of Israel. There's a new covenant which is based pretty much on you know they've done something bad and now God's going to be forgiving them no matter what really um but it's had a physical effect on Moses he shines with it and I like it's sort of like Moses now has like this much deeper relationship with God because he has been sort of wrestling which is what Israel is right that's what Israel means stands means to wrestle with God God Moses has spent this time and now there's a physical change that people can see on him. Um, fun fact, some translations um, wrongly translate shine as uh, horned. So there you can find lots of medieval paintings of Moses with horns because of it. Um, I like shine better rather than uh, because it's shining face and I don't like the idea of horns coming out of a face really. Um, but Moses has physically changed. People can see now that he's got this sort of um, this new relationship. There's a physical manifestation of it. So what is the point of this story? Well, OK, I know I said earlier that it's not about um, God's grace being enough for all our sin, but it is, let's face it, it that's I feel like I've just spent 10 minutes just going back around to where I started. But hey, ho. To your time and wasting not mine <laughs> as my teacher would often say um yes god's grace is 
big enough for all our sin. And that's what that covenant is. No matter what the Israelites do, even, you know, breaking two of the first commandments almost instantly in such a horrendous way, God comes back for them. But I think the other side of this story is about kind of how do we relate with God? Is he a distant being who we sort of think about and have to sort of hide away from? Or is he someone that we feel comfortable actually talking with and actually arguing I might not be fully comfortable with, but, you know, almost confronting. Uh, when we did that prayer course with uh, Pete Gregg, one of the things that he said in that is, you know, when you're praying, you've got to keep it real, you know, keep it honest. There's no point lying to God. And Moses definitely does that. He doesn't pull his punches. But at the end of the day, the reason why Moses seems to be comfortable enough to do that is because he knows God. He knows the promises that God makes or has made. He knows the character of God. And therefore, he knows that he all he's doing is affirming to God who he is. Um, I know one of my pet peeves in like group prayer time is when people list out what they think or who God is. And I always think it's a bit redundant because I know it's nice for me when someone comes up to me and says, oh, Callum, you're like this and you're this and you're this. But that's mostly because, you know, I'm a bit of an idiot and I don't really know what I am. So when someone comes up and tells me things, it's good to know that. But God knows all about himself. And I feel like, oh, God must be so bored being sat up there. But actually, that's such a what such a big part of Moses's relationship with God was just sort of telling God who he is. And through that, Moses had such a great relationship. So maybe it's a pet peeve that I need to get over. And that'll be my, I suppose, the challenge of uh, this story is. How do you know God well enough that you can tell him who he is? and build that relationship from there. Uh, I'm gonna pass back over to Catherine.